The world's longest-serving president, President Teodoro Obiang of Equatorial Guinea, will run for office again in November elections, likely extending a 43-year tenure that began when he snatched power in a 1979 coup. The rule of Obiang, who is now 80 years old, has been marked by torture of political opponents, sham elections and corruption, rights groups and foreign powers say, but he's long denied these charges. Under President Theodore Obiang, the country has become increasingly reclusive and reliant on oil and gas, which provides about three quarters of state revenues. Now, joining us for this conversation, we have Abdul Latif Ahmed, he is the head of research and monitoring desk right here in your Central TV. Thank you so much for joining us, Abdul Latif. Thank you for having me. So let's look at this. Secretary Guinea's 80-year-old president, Theodore Obiang Gwema Mbasogo, who has ruled the country for 43 years, confirmed he will stand again in November's elections. You know, earlier on, we had conversations with Professor Makesh Kabila. He talked about the quality and competence of African leaders. Now, we've seen an 80-year-old man who has ruled for 43 years saying he will stand again. I mean, was it? Ex did you expect this to happen, and were you surprised by this announcement? First of all, I wasn't surprised to have uh, heard the declaration that he was going to run again, but it reminded me of the words of Mo Ibrahim, who declared some time ago, considering the age of uh, uh, African heads of state, are we mad? Are we okay in this, on this continent? Hmm. Uh, you know, there's a certain age where you would have uh, been, you would have outgrown certain things, or you will have, you have been seen to, be, um, to, to have done enough, well enough, to leave the stage for others to take uh, uh, up the saddle of leadership. So it wasn't surprising. Uh, it was almost a given that he was going to run uh, again. Now, relative his son and vice president, popularly known as Teodorin, Teodoro Ngema Obiang Mange, made the announcement via Twitter last Friday, saying it was because of his charisma his leadership and political experience. And you do agree with me that uh, when it comes to political experience, 43 years is as good as you get. So the big question is, after 43 years, is there no one that can take the country uh, to the next level? Because you're talking about returning an 80-year-old man who spent 43 years in power. The problem with such leadership is not just um, how long uh, he has stayed in power. It's about how he has made the state about himself and made himself about the state. Mm. Do not forget that in 2003 or thereabout, he declared himself a god, and um, he believes everything about the state should run around him. So he said um, he had the power over all men and all things in Equatorial Guinea. What it, ha what it does is to ensure that certain um, uh, considerations in, in, you know, in governance, certain things that are not done correctly, cannot be revisited because uh, everything about the state has become uh, about himself and his family. Nobody questions uh, inap uh, inappropriate uh, behavior. Nobody question questions um, misappropriation. Uh, everything about the state essentially is what, what run. What about you know, opposition and civil society groups in Equatorial Guinea? Uh, over, over, over the years, uh, he has repressed uh, civil society. He has repressed journalists and he has repressed uh, the opposition. And that is why he has about 99% uh, um, mm. uh, spread in the, in the parliament. Of, again, uh, having stayed in power that long, he has uh, become almost like a demigod and uh, almost uh, someone who cannot be challenged in, in terms of decision making that has far reaching implication for the gener gen generality of the people in the country. Now, for 43 years, uh, would you say there has been growth in Equatorial Guinea? Because some people would argue that if he has been there and he has been doing well, then he should continue. Has there been growth in Equatorial Guinea? Uh, there, are, there are considerations for growth uh, in different sectors of the uh, country, but you cannot tie those growth to uh, special uh, programs or policy by the government. Uh, it's, a, it's a state that has been entrenched in a lot of uh, graft and corruption, uh, the son who is a vice president has been enmeshed in international uh, graft for which a lot of his properties uh, has been confiscated. Uh, however, the country has shown uh, good indices in terms of uh, the educational sector. However, it doesn't translate to uh, better jobs for people because uh, a lot of uh, equatorial Guineans are still uh, battling with issues of uh, joblessness.
Now, talking about uh, the country, Equatorial Guinea, it has one of the highest uh, per capita GDPs in Africa. I mean, at par, on a global level, uh, looking at its population and its enormous oil and gas reserves, it should be comparable with a country like Switzerland. Yet, 75% of the population live below the poverty uh, threshold. Why has such a country with enormous oil and gas resources not translated it into economic prosperity? for the majority of its people. It goes back to the same thing. You're talking about a country whose population is about the size of Kisumu in Kenya mm. or Bayelsa State in, in, in Nigeria. Uh, now, imagine the resources of such a country uh, being uh, utilized by essentially one family. Uh, what, it, what it means is that they, it, it becomes an unequal society where uh, even if there is wealth, if the GDP is sound and the economic uh, indices look uh, promising, it's essentially for a few, and the larger population are unable to assess, uh, you know, better jobs. They are unable to assess uh, quality lifestyle, and the human development indices are not anything to write home about. So it, it goes back to the system or structure of governance, where it is run as as as, as if it were a fiefdom. Okay, Abdul Latif, Africa has the youngest youth population in the world yet. Unfortunately, we have quite a number of octogenarians leaders in the continent. I mean, why is this so? Apart from Kenya, where we have about just recently uh, conducted election, we have 55-year-old Bob. Aside that, in most African countries, we see a lot of the leaders, a lot of the presidents in their 70s. Why? The problem with uh, African leadership uh, is essentially that the old uh, seem to assume that leadership is about them and therefore the younger population cannot uh, lead on their own. However, when you remember that uh, at the threshold of independence, most of those who fought for, Niger uh, for African independence, African states' independence, were young, smart people. Uh, the older ones now have entrenched themselves into the system such that they can almost not survive without uh, relying on the state. And they have therefore, uh, you know, arrogated to themselves the power to run states in such a way that um, younger people are only used as, as fodder for climbing in, you know, onto power and remaining in power. Uh, unfortunately, because the younger uh, population of, uh, of you know, Africa uh, has no much access to the, the sort of wealth and the sort of uh, capacity to dislodge this entrenched mm -hmm. uh, vested interest in the system, it becomes like a circle, you know, like theatrics. You, you run circles after four years or five years, and you repeat almost the same thing again and, and over. Because people who ordinarily should leave the space and allow the uh, younger people to come into the system are refusing to do so. It's almost the same in the civil service or you know, across the continent, where people who are ordinarily approaching their ages of retirement either alter their ages of retirement or try to stay in the system longer than necessary. So you have a lot of young African smart, energetic, uh, you know, and sound, who are unable to secure jobs because mm. their parents and their uh, older, you know, the older population have stayed in, you know, in offices that should ordinarily uh, move to other people. Exactly. Yeah. Now, Abdul Latif, for people watching outside the continent and in the diaspora, they're like, hold on, wait a minute, this sounds impossible. Uh, doesn't this president have peers? And what yeah. is the African Union doing about? this bad leadership, because I did talk about uh, this to former President uh, Ian Karma over the weekend, uh, and it said one of the reasons this school's happened is as a result of bad leadership, and the African Union should have an early warning system. Now, the African Peer Review Mechanism, APRM, is a mutually agreed instrument voluntarily acceded to by member states of the African Union as a self-monitoring mechanism. How effective has this instrument been in ensuring good governance on the continent? Or are they afraid of telling themselves the home truth? Beyond telling themselves the home truth, uh, I remember that uh, former President Tawin Beki popularized uh, the African review mechanism for uh, African states. And uh, one of the things that that would ordinarily do is to say, uh, look at this country, something positive has worked in this country. What is it about this country uh, that has made it work? Uh, then you look at another country where things aren't working, and then you say, what is it about this country that is not working, or what is it about this country that can, can be improved? 
uh, the African review mechanism, you know, should be improved upon because beyond having it uh, stated in documents and being read or, you know, quoted in public fora, what we should uh, see more is implementation of uh, the review mechanism such that uh, African, African heads of state and leaders and uh, statemen should be able to speak to themselves and speak truth to themselves. Uh, co uh, countries where such reviews are not uh, implemented uh, essentially return to, you know, as a pariah state where nobody really wants to uh, be involved with them. Equatorial Guinea is slightly different because it has uh, enormous resources in terms of oil and gas and other resources. So uh, sometimes even when you want to um, set certain uh, conditionalities against them, there are still other global players who come into uh, such countries to interact or transact uh, with them as the case may be. Okay, thank you very much, Abdul Latif Ahmed. This is where we drop the anchor on today's show. Thank you for your time. Always a pleasure having you join us on The Conversation. Thank you for having me. Okay, this is where we draw the curtains on today's edition of The Conversation. The first half, we do talk about uh, the case for an African uh, seat on the United Nations Security Council, a permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council. We just concluded our conversation with Abdel Latif Ahmed on the upcoming elections in Equatorial Guinea as the president has declared his intention to run for a sixth term in office after spending 43 years in power. Benga Aboroa. And I am Rita Omodia. See you again on Wednesday.